We'll continue then with the study. Three, and this is 3.30 on Wednesday afternoon. Almost quarter four. Thank you. Let me also get this microphone. I hope that's on study 24. Turn now to John, the first chapter. And um, I'll be a part. I still have a thought to finish on page 131 of the Sire of Ages, which I've almost forgotten. And um, once again, we look at the holy angels. The second last paragraph on page 131. After the foe had departed, Jesus fell exhausted to the earth with the pallor of death upon his face. Now literally he was dying, dying of two things. The dreadful effects of starvation, which had been of course made worse by the mental and spiritual strains which Satan had put him that had drained what strength was left and uh, now he, was f he fell to the earth with the pallor of death upon him. The angels of heaven had watched the conflict, beholding their loved commander as he passed through inexpressible suffering to make a way of escape for us. He had endured the test greater than we shall ever be called to endure. The angels now ministered to the Son of God as, as he lay like one dying. He was strengthened with food, comforted with the message of his father's love and the assurance that all heaven triumphed in his victory. Warming, <clears throat> warming to life again, his great heart goes out in sympathy for man and he goes forth to complete the work he has begun to rest not until the foe is vanquished and our fallen race redeemed. Now as the statement says, the angels had watched this struggle with intense interest. For how long? Every second of it, for the whole 40 days of it. Now once again, those angels are beings who are filled with, with tremendous sympathy and compassion and love, are they not? They're holy angels and they're loving angels, compassionate and sympathetic. And they had a very, very special love for Jesus Christ, their beloved commander. Now as the days went by and they watched Christ sinking lower and lower in the, in the scale of vitality because of starvation, they were him alone out there in distress because of his position, what do you suppose their great hearts of compassion called upon them to do? do Go to him and do something, right? Do something to bring him food, to bring him comfort and assurance, and to assist him in the battle against Satan's temptations. And once again, if the only thing that motivated them was that was the spirit in them, the compassion and the love and the sympathy in them, would they have waited till this last moment to go to Christ's side? Never. It had gone there long, long before. But what governed their actions? The plain, thus set the or what are my orders? And um, they waited very patiently until God gave the clearance and then they went and to Christ's side and ministered to him. Which once again, of course, emphasizes the point that the angels are examples to us of what holy living actually is. And we like them must not allow the only motivation to be sympathy, compassion and love, but we must make sure that we are moved by God's orders and not by our feelings, not by impressions, not by, not by feelings of love and compassion, but by the command of God and nothing else but that. And God delayed the... Now, God himself, of course, did not desire for one moment to see Christ suffer. God desires none of us to suffer. It is not God who demands suffering of his people. What demands that we suffer? The requirements of the great controversy, right? It's the issues involved in the great controversy which require us to suffer in order that the victory might be gained and so Christ had to go through the suffering too. And um, I, should, I should like to suggest that we make a special point of remembering this ministry of the angels so that when we find ourselves tempted during the year to react to a situation by living out our compassion and sympathy before we check with God to see what his orders are remember the faithfulness of the angels in doing that so we don't make the mistakes that we might otherwise make it could well be that the person that you're moved to help today is passing through a period of trial and test which must continue until a certain victory is gained and if you jump in and uh, play God to that person too early then what are you going to do? spoil the lesson Okay, you'll spoil the lesson. So therefore, God's wisdom alone must be the guiding factor in these things, not our compassion. And always the question, what are my orders? 
Let's turn now to the very interesting chapter we have found the Messiah, starting on page 132. And the reference, of course, is John, the first chapter, verses 19 to 51. We won't read the entire scripture to begin with, but uh, it will serve, of course, as a basis for our reading of the book Desire of Ages in this respect. John chapter 1, verses 19 to 51. We read just a little first of all. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor least neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one amongst you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things are done uh, in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. <clears throat> we'll pass fairly quickly over the experience of John the Baptist excepting that um, I do want to draw a contrast between the spirit in those Pharisees and the spirit which was in Jesus Christ and a contrast between their way of kingdom building and Christ's way of kingdom building. In fact the way in which Christ went about his, his, the beginnings of his work is quite a revelation of the principle by which we also in turn have to operate. And I was most impressed as I read this story through just a little while back and saw some things in the work of Jesus Christ I had not seen before, which I think will be a great blessing and help to all of us at this time. Right, page 132. John the Baptist was now preaching and baptizing at Bethabara, or Bethabara, whichever way you want to pronounce it, beyond Jordan. It was not far from this spot that God had stayed the river in its flow until Israel had passed over. A little distance from here, the stronghold of Jericho had been overthrown by the armies of heaven. The memory of these events was at this time revived and gave a thrilling interest to the Baptist message. Would not he who had wrought so wonderfully in ages past again manifest his power for, the, for Israel's deliverance? Such was the thought stirring the hearts of the people who daily thronged the banks of the Jordan. Now geographically then, I don't have any maps in my Bible which actually um, identify Bethabara or Bethabara, but in as much as we know from this statement it was very, very close to the city of Jericho. It was then very obviously just north of the Dead Sea and not too far, of course, in turn from Jerusalem. A little way, but not too far from Jerusalem. And the representatives from the Pharisees journeyed down there to ask John these very searching questions in regard to his ministry. Now, these leaders were in deep trouble, as we shall now read, and I want you to notice how they reacted to the problem which they found themselves confronted with, a problem, of course, which should never exist in any way and would not have existed but for the spirit which was in them, the spirit of unbelief and the spirit of disobedience. The preaching of John had taken so deep a hold on the nation as to demand the attention of the religious authorities. The danger of insurrection caused every popular gathering to be looked upon with suspicion by the Romans and whatever pointed toward an uprising of the people excited the fears of the Jewish rulers. John had not recognized the authority of the Sanhedrin by seeking their sanction for his work and he had reproved rulers and people Pharisees and Sadducees alike. Yet the people followed him eagerly. The interest in his work seemed to be continually increasing. Though he had not deferred to them, the Sanhedrin accounted that as a public teacher he was under their jurisdiction. This body was made up, made, made up of members chosen from the priesthood and from the chief rulers and teachers of the nation. The high priest was usually the president. All its members were to be men advanced in years, though not aged. Men of learning, not only versed in Jewish religion and history, but in general knowledge. They were to be without physical blemish and must be married men and fathers as being more likely than others to be humane and considerate. Their place of meeting was an apartment connected with the Temple of Jerusalem 
In the days of Jewish independence, the Sanhedrin was a supreme court of the nation possessing secular as well as ecclesiastical authority. Though now subordinated by the Roman governors, it still exercised a strong influence in civil as well as religious matters. Now, when was the Sanhedrin born? When was the 70 born? Way back in the days of Moses. A.T. Jones confirms that in his writings as well. I'll just briefly acquaint you with how this came into being. In, 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 in short, it was the child of unbelief, and the unbelief was, in, of all people, Moses. And it's a very sad thing, of course, that um, this should have happened. The record is on page 380. And Moses had just been confronted with one of those rebellions and murmurings which were the plague of Israel, and um, which, which brought such distress and burden to the heart and life of Moses. I read now on page 379 across to page 318. The heart of Moses sank. He had pleaded that Israel should not be destroyed even though his own posterity might then become a great nation. In his love for them he had prayed that his name might be blotted in the book of life rather than that they should be left to perish. He had imperiled all for them and this was their response. All their hardships, even their imaginary sufferings were charged upon him and their wicked murmurings made doubly heavy the burden of care and responsibility under which he staggered. In his distress he was tempted even to distrust God. His prayer was almost a complaint. Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And where, wherefore have I not found favour in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. Now what was Moses forgetting? He was forgetting his orders, right? He was concerning himself with the consequences, not with the orders. And he was letting faith grow dim in his experience as a result. Now, God was very kind to Moses, even though God knew what he was about to do would bring dreadful results upon Israel later. And so I read, The Lord hearkened to his prayer and directed him to summon 70 men of the elders of Israel men not only advanced in years but possessing dignity and sound judgment and experience and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation he said that they may stand there with thee and I will come down and talk with thee there and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and, and, I'll, and will put it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not thyself alone I've always been impressed with the fact that God did not give these men extra spiritual power, but simply gave them some of the power which was already there in the person of Moses. I mean, then how much better off were they? Now comes the main point, page 380 in Patriarchs and Prophets Still. The Lord permitted Moses to choose for himself the most faithful and efficient men to share the responsibility with him. Their influence would assist in holding in check the violence of the people and calling insurrection, yet serious evils would eventually result from their promotion. They would never have been chosen had Moses manifested faith corresponding to the, to the evidence as he had witnessed of God's power and goodness, but he had magnified his own burdens and services, almost losing sight of the fact that he was, he was only the instrument by which God had wrought. He was not excusable in indulging in the slightest degree the spirit of murmuring which was the curse of Israel. Had he relied fully upon God, the Lord would have guided him continually and would have given him strength for every emergency. Now, had he relied fully upon God, or as we maintain his faith, what would have happened? The Lord would have guided him continually or given him orders continually. And uh, he would have given him strength for every emergency. Now the Bible says there's no temptation taken you, but, you but such as is common to man. So God never allows a burden to come upon you excepting God at the same time gives strength to carry that burden. Right? So therefore we must never complain of being overworked in God's service. There's no place for unionism, is there, in God's service? None whatsoever. If God works you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, every, every week of the year, 
and that the work is coming directly from him we do that work we don't complain we simply say all his biddings are enablings we, you say now what are my orders do this what is the promise strength to do this wisdom and strength to do his work and we simply rest in God and believe that um, that God knows what he's doing and so for Moses made a fearful mistake when he murmured at this time and complained he didn't have the strength to do the work which God gave him to do I remember that I back in 1964 or 5 I made the same complaint against God and I had planned to uh, I, I made a plan to to call another person to share the work with me I went back to Australia with that plan in mind and I thought I'll send him overseas every alternative and I'll take the other years and I thought it was a good plan I thought saved me an awful lot of hard work <laughs> <laughs> when I go back um, that particular brother so disgraced himself that uh, the plan had to be completely abandoned and looking back now and then shortly after I read the story of Moses and was very very seriously rebuked by what I read here and I resolved that never again would I deputise to others the work which God had given me to do and um, I, 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 we, we are to learn of course from the lessons of the past now those 70 men as the statement says here at first they were a very effective influence in holding in check the insurrections of Israel but eventually serious evils were to develop because of their promotion and they would never have been chosen had Moses manifested faith corresponding to the evidence he witnessed of God's power and goodness now anything which is the child of unbelief anything which is the child of uh, murmuring and complaining anything which is not the result of living faith in God and therefore the expression of holiness while initially it may turn out to be a good thing in the end will breed what? trouble and disaster for God's cause that's a, that's a rule that you can rely upon with unfailing consistency now by the time we come down to the days of John the Baptist and of Christ himself the 70 had become the Sanhedrin the most powerful civil and ecclesiastical body in the nation even though it was, un, it was subordinated by the Roman governors and had become of course a very evil force in the country too the men who ran this thing were proud despotic and, uh, and overbearing and in the end it was the Sanhedrin that sentenced Jesus Christ to death now if Moses back there could have seen the end result of his murmuring and complaining then I'm sure he would have stilled his tongue very quickly would he not? Yes. very very quickly indeed now these men of course were appointed to their position by the general procedures of human election whereas of course John the Baptist and Jesus Christ himself uh, were appointed their work directly by the God of heaven himself as will be the case with every member of the body of Jesus Christ and so these men now as they saw the ministry of John became very concerned about what John was up to and decided they would have to endorse his work or reject it as the case may be I'd like you to notice now the last remarks on the last main paragraph on page 133. It says that um, it was well known that the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy covering the Messiah's advent were nearly ended and all were eager to share in that era of national glory which was then expected. Such was the popular enthusiasm that the Sanhedrin would soon be forced either to sanction or to reject John's work. Already their power over the people was waning it was becoming a serious question how to maintain their position in the hope of, 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 of arriving at some conclusion they dispatched to the Jordan a deputation of priests and Levites to confer with the new leader or the new teacher rather now it says already their power over the people was waning it was becoming a serious question how to maintain their position that was a very serious question with them now is that ever a serious question with the people of God? No. It's not a question at all, is it? Yeah. Not a question at all. Doesn't even enter their minds. Because so far as a child of God is concerned, he's a member of the body of Christ and he has his appointed work to do and when that work is done, he is very, very glad to lay it down and let others take up the task and carry it on to that point where he found himself earlier. And of course, as we move on later, to the time when John the Baptist said to, uh, about Christ he must increase and I must decrease we find John living out that principle to perfection 
and demonstrating the presence in him of the principles of holiness. But these men um, were losing their grip upon the people for the very, very simple reason they did not have food for the people. And um, when there's no food, then what do the people do? They go elsewhere, right? They go elsewhere. Of course, I stand amazed at the uh, way that folks still attend these modern evangelical churches. <laughs> of course, mind you, the evangelical churches do have something for their people, at least they've got excitement and stimulus and that sort of thing. When you think of some of the uh, great Reformation churches like the Church of England and the Lutheran Church and the uh, Presbyterian Church, you go to those places and the deadness is so terrible it's amazing anyone ever goes near them anymore but they still seem to seem to get people to go there and support them mind you of course we feel far more than the people do because they haven't experienced the light of truth and the contra contrast there is not so evident but those Pharisees back there of course were losing their power over the people and they were trying to figure out some way to retain that power and therefore John and later Christ represented a very serious threat to their authority and therefore they, they got rid of the, uh, the, the threat uh, so, they could, so they could maintain their power, hopefully. Now, as I read before, yesterday, page 133 to 4 now, a multitude were gathered, listening to his words when the delegates approached, with an air of authority designed to impress the people and to command the deference of the prophet, the haughty rabbis came. With a movement of respect, almost of fear, the crowd opened to let them pass. The great men in their rich robes, in the pride of rank and power, stood before the prophet of the wilderness. Now what a contrast. Now here was a man obeying God's orders. A man dressed in very, very rough garments. A man who uh, did not command dignity by his appearance. In fact, the appearance of John the Baptist was so, so, so simple so undignified that from that point of view he certainly could not demand or gain the deference of the people but in John the Baptist there was present a power from him there flowed a stream of truth hungry souls were fed lives were changed and it was the attraction of holiness which brought the people to hear John the Baptist isn't that right? he had food for them he had solutions for them he had the word of God for them on the other hand, of course, these, these richly robed men, they demanded and got to a certain extent respect and uh, reverence by virtue of their manner, their haughty manner, their uh, seeming elevation above the people, their rich robes and so forth. And these things, of course, awed the people to a certain extent. And naturally, of course, one was the manifestation of holiness and the other of unholiness or unrighteousness. Now we look with interest at these questions and the answers which John the Baptist gave. Who are you? they demanded. No, knowing what was in their thoughts, John answered, I am not the Christ. What then? Are you Elijah? I'll just give the Old Testament word for that instead of Elias, which we find here in the New Testament. And he says, I am not. Now, was John in fact the Elijah? Yes, yes he was. How do we know? because in Matthew chapter 11 the, Jesus Christ said so let's go back to Matthew chapter 11 for a moment and read the scripture itself <clears throat> and uh, the answer is down in verse 14 and this of course is Christ's dissertation about John the Baptist after the two disciples of John the Baptist had departed back to the prophet in prison again and Jesus said, And if you will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. In other words, he is the Elijah. Now certainly John the Baptist was not the original Elijah, but he was the antitype of Elijah. And just as John the Baptist was the antitypical Elijah, in those days, then in the last days of human history, again there is to be a, an antitypical Elijah, and an antitypical Elijah people, both the individual and the people. It's quite clear, of course, that the uh, antitypical person has already come and gone, but the people, the Elijah people, are being developed through this message at the present time. Now, in what sense then, John certainly knew who he was, and no question about that. And he was not a he was not a liar either. He wasn't he wasn't so modest he would tell a lie 
because some people are, some whilst they will perhaps even resort to subterfuge to hide their true identity. So, in what sense then did um, John mean that he was not the Elijah? And the answer is given to us on page 135 of the book uh, Desire of Ages. It was believed, this is the last paragraph on page 135, it was believed also that before the Messiah's advent, Elijah would personally appear. This expectation, John met in his denial, but his words had a deeper meaning. So in the first case, the Jewish people, so spiritually blind, expected Elijah himself to appear. And of course they knew from the Old Testament teaching that Elijah had been translated to heaven, and no doubt they thought that this glorious man would come back to the earth again and personally appear before them. And John made it very clear that that was a mistaken idea. He said, I'm not Elijah in person. But there was a deeper meaning than that yet, as we now read. Jesus afterwards said, referring to John, if you are willing to receive it, this is Elijah which is to come. Matthew 11 verse 14, Revised Version. John came in the spirit and power of Elijah to do such a work as Elijah did. If the Jews had received him, it would have been accomplished for them, but they did not receive the message. To them he was not Elijah. He could not fulfill for them the mission he came to accomplish. Just the same as later, of course, Jesus Christ was not to them the Messiah. And that brings us down to our modern time. Remember I've often said that the gospel, Paul did not simply say the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, did he? But to everyone that believeth now to him that believes the gospel is the power of God to, hi, to, him, to him who doesn't believe the gospel is not the power of God it's just a theory or an argument and a person may even um, a person may even talk the principles of the gospel quite accurately that is have, have the gospel in truth but not in power and uh, it still does not have any effect where it is being preached I've had the experience for instance of um one or two folk over the past 20 years have come along and heard me preach and their minds have intellectually accepted the theory of the truth and bondage to freedom. And have actually gone and preached this thing from the pulpits in their churches. And they said, look, they said, you see, you, you're mistaken when you say this message causes separation because the people listen and they, and they like it. And there's no opposition, there's no trouble whatsoever. And I say, yes, I said, and the reason is, I said, you've not yet made this your personal living experience. It, it, you did present that as the power of God. You present it merely as a theory, nothing more than that. And it's true that you can present the theory of the truth without the power of the truth. And what is the effect? There is no effect. The gospel is power. And so when John the Baptist stood before those men back there, they could not, or they could have, but they did not accept him as, as Elijah and therefore he could not do Elijah's work for them, and therefore to them he was not Elijah. So his statement was really rebuked to them. He said, in effect, you'll need to have a very, very big change of attitude and mind before you can receive me as the Elijah and therefore be part of this vital work. So they pursued their questions and said, Art thou that prophet? And he said, No. Then who are you? So we might give an answer to them who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And the reply was, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Or, 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 or Isaiah. Now then comes the comments, of course, in regard to John's ministry, that um, follow on the next page about the mountains being flattened and the valleys being filled to prepare the way of the king. It's quite interesting, you know, that whenever the Queen of England comes to Canada or to Australia or to New Zealand, and they know exactly where she's going to come, and that part of the town gets really spruced up, doesn't it? <laughs> so, so when the Queen comes, she sees the country looking not, not like it really is normally, but uh, as they wanted to think about it. So when she goes home again, she has those nice pictures in her mind. Now I'll pass over that part because, um, accepting to say, of course, that John understood precisely what his work was. He knew his orders, and he was there to prepare the way of the Lord, not to be the Lord himself. And as we shall read later in the chapter dealing with he must increase but I must decrease, we find that John overcame the temptation which has been the downfall of so many before he did not grasp the opportunity to make himself a great king and a great lord. He understood exactly what his mission was. Now, we move on down or move across to page 136. 
and um, there comes a very important lesson now in regard to the lack of spiritual perception possessed by those who gathered at the Jordan River first of all when Christ was baptized and who are now gathered at the Jordan River again to witness this questioning on the part of these leaders many of those gathered at the Jordan had been present at the baptism of Jesus but the sign then given had, had been manifest to but few amongst them now what was the sign then given namely back at the baptism the dove right and the voice of God saying this is my beloved son but only very very few amongst the people had perceived that voice at that point of time now why not because they refused to receive John's message during the preceding months of the Baptist ministry that is the months preceding Christ's baptism many had refused to heed the call to repentance thus they had hardened their hearts and darkened their understanding when heaven bore testimony to Jesus at his baptism they perceived it not eyes which had never been turned in faith to him who is invisible beheld not the revelation of the, of the glory of God ears which had never listened to his voice heard not the words of witness so it is now often the presence of Jesus and the ministering angels is manifest in the assemblies of the people and yet there are many who know it not they discern nothing unusual but to some the Saviour's presence is revealed peace and joy animate their hearts they are comforted, encouraged and blessed and this turns my mind to the story in uh, early writings or the vision in the early writings page 240 the chapter is called the Advent Movement Illustrated where Sister White saw a number of companies that were bound together by cords and in these companies the majority of people in those companies had their eyes directed downwards to earthly things that is what absorbed their attention and nothing else but that but here and there to the companies there was an individual or two whose eyes were directed upwards to heaven and um, I thought to myself when I read that it would, be, it would be a wonderful thing if before the 1888 message had been again introduced to the church that the members had been called upon to spend about three or four years reading and rereading this the life story of Jesus Christ especially in the Bible and of course in the book Desire of Ages as well now if the church if every member of the church had been very very earnestly and prayerfully reading that book three or four three or four or five or six times through a repeat of three years before the message came again then what would you expect to find a greater response wouldn't you it still might not be universal but at least a greater response but you know if you go to the average seven day Adventist home and look at their bibles and their spirit of prophecy they're all in mint condition ever noticed that mm -hmm. they're hardly ever opened right Whereas, of course, amongst us, the books get very tattered and worn, don't they? <laughs> and uh, so, as, as the statement says, the people were unresponsive because they had not responded to the, the Baptist ministry and therefore could not, in turn, see and hear the announcement of Christ's presence amongst them, even though it was given by God himself. Now, 240, 240 onwards, the Advent Movement Illustrated, now we come now to another announcement of Jesus Christ the deputies from Jerusalem had demanded of John why baptizest thou and they were, they were awaiting his answer suddenly as his glance swept over the throng his eye kindled his face lighted up his whole being was stirred with deep emotion in other words he, he was now receiving an inspiration from the Holy Spirit and was about to utter words given to him by the Holy Spirit and, he, and, and it says with outstretched hands he cried I baptize in water in the midst of you standeth one whom you know not even he that cometh after me the latchet of whose shoe I am not worthy to unloose let's put this in modern English he says I baptize in water right in the middle of, you, middle of you now one is standing whom you don't know and he is the one that comes after me and the latchet of his shoe I am not worthy to unloose now what an announcement John the Baptist was saying there's a crowd of people here and right in that crowd right now is the Messiah he's there now two things of course interest me here greatly first of all Christ didn't step out and take a bow did he? <laughs> <laughs> and that's significant 
In fact, we're going to find as we move on over the next page or two, it's incredible how, how Christ totally avoided any movement on his part to advertise himself, to announce himself, but he just calmly waited until the Spirit of God did that for him, and then even when his first two disciples began to follow him, he almost discouraged them from coming after him. He said, well, what do you, what do you fellows want? Where are you going? And he would, he would leave them free, we'll, we'll read, to, to, choose their, to choose to go back if that's what they wish to do. How differently Christ built his kingdom from the ways in which modern evangelistic um, pastors and preachers seek to build up the church. Now I'll read further. The message was distinct and unequivocal to be carried back to the Sanhedrin. The words of John could apply to no other than the long-promised one. The Messiah was among them. In amazement, priests and rulers gazed about them, hoping to discover him of whom John had spoken, but he was not distinguishable amongst the throng. All right, they looked around, where is he? Which, which one of all these people is the Messiah? But Christ did not give any indication whatsoever. He was not distinguishable amongst the throng. Was he there? Yes. Right, but not distinguishable. In fact, um, as we shall read the next page, page 137, Christ at this time was worn, pale and emaciated. Note that he looked suddenly to be a very, very old man at that point, shriveled, wrinkled, just skin hanging on the bone structure and uh, needing a great deal of um, restoration to rebuild the wasted tissues because of his immense fast up there on the mountaintop. And I suppose if, if anyone happened to see him there, which they would have done amongst the people, they thought, well, that old man there, that skinny old man, he certainly couldn't be the Messiah. No way in the world, right? In fact, uh, when John finally recognised him, it was only by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I read now <clears throat> further. When at the baptism of, John, of Jesus, John pointed to him as the Lamb of God, a new light was shed upon the Messiah's work. The prophet's mind was directed to the words of Isaiah, he has brought a lamb to the slaughter. During the weeks which followed, John with new interest stated the prophecies and the teaching of the sacrificial service. He did not distinguish clearly the two phases of Christ's work as a suffering sacrifice and a conquering king, but he saw that his coming had a deeper significance than priests or people had discerned. When he beheld Jesus amongst the throng on his return from the desert, he confidently looked for him to give the people some sign of his true character. Almost impatiently, he waited to hear the Saviour declare his mission, but no word was spoken, no sign given. Jesus did not respond to the Baptist announcement of him, but mingled with the disciples of John, giving no outward evidence of his special work, and taking no measures to bring himself to notice. Right, that to me is very significant. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a procedure or a pathway which will definitely be followed by God's true workers at any given time down through Earth, Earth's history. Even when John the Baptist said that he is there, and when John the Baptist recognised him as being there, and John expected Jesus Christ to make an announcement of himself, and he waited impatiently, or almost impatiently, to hear the Saviour declare his mission, but no word was spoken, no sign given. In other words, Christ had no orders to reveal himself, to announce himself, or to, or to initiate a program, but day by day the Lord said, just, just follow my orders, I will make the contacts, I will bring you into company with the, with the right people, I will call your first disciples and your work will expand and expand under my personal direction so God the Father said to him and Jesus Christ although maybe he could have been tempted to say yes I'm the Messiah and started working miracles and even preaching right there and then absolutely kept himself completely out of sight and gave no sign to anyone that he was the promised one now the next day and this apparently is the very next day after the delegates had gone back to Jerusalem after he had said to them that in the midst of you stands the Messiah. The next day John sees Jesus coming with the light of the glory of God resting upon him. The prophet stretches out his hand declaring, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is, be which is become before me. And I knew him not, but he that should be made manifest that he that should be made manifest to Israel for this cause I came baptizing with water 
I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he has sent me to baptize in water. He said to me, Upon whomsoever thou shalt see the Spirit descending and abiding upon him, the same as he that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So by what means did John know that Jesus was, was the Son of God? By the ministry of whom? Spirit. Spirit. Right. It was, it was by the revelation of the Spirit of God. Now, of course, um, we must recognize the point that uh, Christianity is a revealed religion. It's something that God makes plain to our minds. It doesn't come by logic. It doesn't come by men searching out the deep mysteries of God's Word. It is something which comes by revelation and not by human logic. And so it was that John Baxter was given a revelation by the Spirit of God that this was indeed the Messiah. Now, this time, John pointed to the person. And the people now asked the question, they, they should have said, all right, if that's the person, then that's the person. And they should have accepted Jesus Christ for what he was and as he was because the Spirit of God said, that's the man. But, we read now, was this the Christ? Should they have asked that kind of question? Never. They should have believed. They should have obeyed the Word of God and believed the Word of God. With awe and wonder, the people looked upon the one just declared to be the Son of God. They had been deeply moved by the words of John. He had spoken to them in the name of God. They had listened to him day after day as he reproved their sins, and daily the conviction he was sent, he was sent of heaven had strengthened. But who was this one greater than John the Baptist? In his dress and bearing there was nothing in that nothing that betokened rank. He was apparently a simple personage, clad like themselves in the humble garments of the poor. There were in the throng some who at Christ's baptism had beheld the divine glory and had heard the voice of God, but since that time the Saviour's appearance had greatly changed. At his baptism they had seen his countenance transfigured, transfigured in the light of heaven, now pale, worn and emaciated, he had been recognised only by the prophet John. And then by what means? <coughs> right, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But as the people looked upon him, they saw a face where divine compassion was blended with conscious power. Every glance of the eye, every feature of the countenance was marked with humility and expressive of an utterable love. He seemed to be surrounded by an atmosphere of spiritual influence. While his manners were gentle and unassuming, he impressed men with a sense of power which was hidden, which could not be wholly concealed. Was this the one for whom Israel had so long waited? Jesus came in, humili in poverty and humiliation and he might be our example as well as, well as our Redeemer. And it talks about the fact, of course, um, that Christ came to the poor so that the poor would not feel that the gospel was just for the rich. Now, we'll move on in the next study period as our time has now gone to note the way in which Christ called his first disciples or how those men were called to him and how the work began to be established back in those days and to note how differently Christ began to build his kingdom from the way in which worldly policy and planning seeks to build the churches of today. So time has gone, so we'll stop at that point. Any questions? Good, let's take a closing hymn then.